Guten Morgen, mein Herr und mein Damen. Willkommen Sie ein... No, 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 no. Forget that. Okay, what's up with the German phrases? Well, we're gonna talk about... Why do I say we? I don't have a mouse in my pocket. I'm going to talk a little bit about this piece that many of you helped me uh, research oh, a couple weeks ago. So, stay tuned. Remember this? I didn't know what it was when I found it. But it was good quality. I knew it was old. I had to buy it. So I did. It took me a long time to find the hallmark on it. Here's a picture of it. It's a little, what is that, a goose? No, it's an ostrich, you know, trotting along the path somewhere. And uh, I really didn't do any research on it. I just threw it out there and asked for help. And lots of you did some research and you were able to come back and tell me that indeed you knew what it was and that it was manufactured by the uh, WFM company. So that's the initials for the company, which is Württemberg, uh, Württembergische Machenfabrik, uh, which is basically factory in Württemberg, Germany. And they made metalwork, usually copper or silver, and that's what this is. So this dates to about 1910, 1915, maybe as late as 1920. One of the last um, secession, I guess there were, I did a lot of reading about this because I'm not an art history, I did not study art in college, I was a music major as an undergrad. And I probably took a couple of art appreciation classes the way we all do, but I didn't study decorative arts and I did not study art history. So I had to do some research on it um, and discovered that it was, that there were three secession movements in Germany. Well, prior to unified Germany anyway. Uh, one, one called, well, I've got a cheat sheet here somewhere. Here it is. I'll just read it, what it says. Um, one of the last art movements of the 19th century, the Berlin Secession, uh, was also a breakaway group of artists who in 1898 seceded from the city's arts establishment and led by the eminent painter Max Lieberman. There were a couple of other secession movements prior to that uh, during the Art Nouveau period and even just prior to that. Um, this work is very typical of this company, I'm sorry, this factory. And so after looking at several examples of their work, I think I would be able to recognize it. And that is what's so, like any day when I can learn something new about antiques and decorative arts, that's a great day for me. And I knew nothing about this um, prior to doing the research on it. So it's basically a porcelain tray that is painted with wonderful copper work on the outside. Um, there's nothing on the back except a few numbers and then the little tiny hallmark here on the rim. So uh, this also came with several different images on the front, but with the same copper rim. And you could also buy little tiny coasters, a set of six or eight coasters to go with it. So this is just a serving tray. Again, about 1910. Um, the nice thing about this is if you'll look at the patina on the copper, this was not polished within an inch of its life. Look at these pictures. Now, I don't know about you, but I prefer it unpolished. And I think we can clearly see, I mean, you know, we've all, you've been in the antiques business long enough, you know, don't clean it, don't polish it, right? Don't refinish it. And we can see here, these examples have just been polished to death and therefore the original patina has been removed and so has a great deal of the value. So back to this piece, which has been unpolished. Uh, I think it looks great. After saying all that, how much is it worth? I don't know, 
20, 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks. It probably doesn't have a great deal of value and there would be a very small market, I think, but there are collectors of turn of the century German secession art and decorative items. So I have put this up for auction. I think my bidding starts out. I started my, I started my, my opening bid uh, at, well, it's not an opening bid, but that's the least amount that I would take for it. And that, that, that would be the opening bid for someone who wants to buy it. I think I started it out at like $24 and then I think I raised it. I changed my mind. I said, no, I'm going to raise it to like 50, 50 or 60 bucks. Let it go for 10 days, seven or 10 days and just see what happens to it. Uh, some of this metalwork made by this particular factory sells very well and some doesn't. So we'll just see what happens. Um, I like it. And who would have thought that here in Philadelphia, I would walk into a Goodwill, which is where I found this, paid less than $5 for it, you know, that I would find a piece of turn of the century um, German secession art or decorative arts. Okay, so that's what that is. Thanks everybody who helped me out with that. I guess I don't know what to do with it. I'm just so excited because, you know, I'm back in my uh, New Orleans brothel set, right? Okay, so that's currently up for auction in the old Curiosity Shop. I also went ahead and put this puzzle up for auction. You watched me put it together about six videos back when we first went on lockdown. Here's a picture of the puzzle completed so that you'll know that all of the Moonbeam's princess pieces are there. And if you didn't see that video, um, you can go back and look at it. But that's the puzzle. It is complete. Um, these sell for... 15, 20, 25 dollars. This one being complete should sell for about 20, uh, maybe 25. We'll see what happens, but that's up for auction. And uh, also, let's see, I'm going to tell you more about these in tomorrow's video, which I, ax which I actually taped yesterday. I know that sounds very confusing, but here are four, here are three nesting bowls by Hazel Atlas. These aren't listed yet, so uh, stay tuned for tomorrow's video, video and you'll see what I think I'm going to do with those. It's 1930s depression glass. Okay, now, hold on. Let's talk about this guy. I think this was in my kitchen counter when I was making, what was I making? Anyway, you've seen this before. It's listed right now in the old curiosity shop. What is it? Well, here is a good valuable lesson and I've been meaning to talk about this and, and this is just a fine example um, of a pitfall that we can all fall into. And I know I am guilty of this and uh, it's sort of just dangerous to do, and that is uh, just Google it. Um, you know, when you just Google stuff, you have to take into account that what you're Googling and what you're reading might be incorrect. And you always have to wonder about your sources. So for example, if I said to you, gee, I don't know what this is. It looks like a piece of early American pressed glass. Now, uh, as, a, as a glass collector, when I look at this, this reminds me of the work of Northwood or um, Dugan or Fenton or one of those early pattern glass companies that also made stretch glass, carnival glass, um, oh, around 1905, 1910, that kind of era. That's what it reminds me of. So if I'm not sure, what would you type in as your Google search? Well, you would probably type in blue opalescent glass creamer cherries, All right? When you do that, and I did, lots of pictures of this come up. Then if I go to sites like eBay and Etsy and I do the same search, I find several examples of it and everybody has a different description 
and they are all almost all attributing it to a different company. Here's a list of some of the companies that this is attributed to. The LG Wright Company, Dugan, later to be Dugan Diamond, Fenton, Westmoreland, and L.E. Smith. I saw auction listings uh, stating that this was made by any one of those companies. So who's right and who's wrong? Well, see, that's the thing. If I just Google this and I look at the very first picture that comes up, I might say, oh, gee, it's Fenton. Then the next picture says, well, it's Dugan. Well, it's Westmoreland. Well, and so forth and so on. So, got to do a little more work than just Googling. So I spent more time than I should have <laughs> because we have some time on our hands. And I think I got to the bottom of this guy. Now, as I said, my thought when I saw it was that, that it was a reproduction. I think it's a reproduction and I'm going to stick with that. Uh, but it seems as though this was produced by the LG Wright Company. Now let's talk about LG Wright for a minute. And what I'm going to do is read something to you from a website that I go to often, and that's called Real, Real or Repro.com. I like that site. Um, I think I've told you about it before. Again, it's called Real or Repro.com. This is one of the sources that I checked. And let's listen to what they had to say about the LG Wright Company. Uh, confusing patterns since 1930. The LG Wright Glass Company, LG Wright Glass, uh, and the molds that made it have caused confusion and controversy among antique collectors ever since the company was founded in 1937 by Lawrence Wright. That's because Wright, unlike other glass companies at the time, based his entire line on reproductions and reissues of antique patterns and shapes. Wright, who at one time had the word antique on his business card, was one of the first to capitalize on antique, on American interest in early American pattern glass. And it really was the 30s when, uh, when folks really started getting into collecting early American pattern glass. By 1938, Wright had new molds designed to make, at what that time were reproductions of some of the most popular antique patterns, including Baltimore Pear, and we have all seen, haven't you all seen, you know, the Baltimore Pear? We see it all the time in, uh, there's sort of a, oh, a pink color. I've seen it in clear glass. Almost every antique mall has a Baltimore Pear cream and sugar. Uh, Daisy, uh, Daisy and Button, Lion, and the three-faced Westward Ho. You see a lot of Westward Ho, re Westward Ho reproduced as well. Wright Glass continued to specialize in reproductions and reissues until they closed in 1998. Now, another source I have say, say they closed in 1999. So 99 or 98, either one, that's when they closed. Now, listen to this. The majority by far of Wright's glass was made from new molds, not original molds. All of Wright's three, okay, that's not important. That's the Westward Ho, we're not talking about that. Listen to this. Wright did own and use a number of original molds from the old Northwood and Dugan companies. And some of the molds that he reissued from those companies were Pony, Stork and Rushes, and Cherry. Cherry, okay? So I cross-referenced this to uh, another source that said, indeed, in 1939, um, LG Wright purchased old molds from Northwood and Dugan, which Dugan... I think went out of business. So it was then Dugan Diamond at that point. And some of the molds that he bought and reissued were, in, were the cherry pattern. So those two references, which are very reputable, check out. And then if you also go to replacements, they list this as being made. They had one, I think, in milk glass, but also in blue opalescent. They attribute it to LG Wright, and they also say that it was made circa 19... 60. Uh, 
Okay, so that helps us a lot, I think, to narrow it down. Uh, I even went all the way through my Fenton book, uh, 1907 to 1939. There's nothing in there uh, by Fenton that looks like this. But this is almost certainly uh, a Northwood. It's either a Northwood or a Dugan mold that was purchased by L.G. Wright sometime in the late 30s and then reproduced for several years by that company. So again, some of my information came from realorrepro.com. And I think the lesson here is, if I had just typed in the description of this and Googled it, I would be listing it as any one of those companies that I'm, any one of those five or six companies uh, that I mentioned, and I would have been listing it uh, erroneously. So I try to do my best and do as much research as I can to make sure that I'm putting out accurate information. And it's just, it's a good reminder to me to not always trust the first thing that you see or the first description or the first picture that pops up when you Google something, but further research really does pay off. So uh, now, after all that, what's it worth? They sell for anywhere from like 15 to $25, something like that. And this is nice in the blue opalescent. So, uh, hey, it's up for grabs in the old curiosity shop. When I saw this piece at the Goodwill, uh, I picked it up. I recognized it as, as a well-made quality piece of glass. I put it down. It was bugging me. When I went back the next day, it was still there, and I did buy it for myself. I cannot remember, I think the reason why I didn't purchase it immediately, it was probably about seven or eight dollars, which is more than what I usually pay for glass in Goodwill. But uh, it's just, I like smoked glass. And I don't know how well this is showing up with this busy curtain behind me, but it almost has a little bit of an amethyst look to it as well. But it really, I think, would be classified as smoke, smoked glass. And I'm not sure who made it. A lot of this glass was made uh, in Europe. Many times you'll find this glass made in Czechoslovakia. But there were also English companies. Bagley is, Bagley is one I can think of. So I'm not really sure. This is going to take me a while to do some research on, on this piece of glass. There were American companies who made it as well. It's very heavy. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Besides the price tag, I'm going to try to get this. Let me get my get the fingerprints off of it. Okay, and then ignore the remnants of the price tag. Can you see on the bottom? Uh, I don't know whether you can or not, but there are some. There's a nice amount of wear on the bottom. You see that? That kind of wear also suggests that it's been sliding around a table for 60, 70, 80 years. Um, I would say that this piece of glass probably dates to the 1930s. Um, and it is a vase. So um, I'm going to continue doing some research to try to figure out which company uh, made this really pretty glass vase. And the last thing that I want to show you is I've been digging through my LP collection <laughs> and I don't know where this came from and I can't, I can't remember how I acquired it. I have never heard of Junior Walker before my time. 
Junior Walker and the All-Stars, Home Cooking. It's good music. He's a good sax player. I played it. I like it. But I didn't realize that there's an inscription on the back. And let me read to you this inscription. It says... By the way, before I read it, read it. The album is dated 1968. And here's what the inscription says uh, in blue ink. Not so long ago, Junior Walker and I are the dearest and closest of friends. A few years back, not so long ago, he asked me, asked me to write liner notes. I do now proudly. To you, Junior, signed, Diana Ross. <laughs> I think this is an original Diana Ross signature. Take a look at it. Hold, hold it still. All right, can you see that? All right, everybody. Now go do your research on the Diana Ross signature and tell me what, what you think. You see how it's scribbled on there? I don't even know where Diana Ross was or what she was doing uh, when I was one year old in 1968. I like Diana Ross. And um, <laughs> what is this worth with her? If it's really her signature, what is it worth? I don't know, probably nothing, but isn't that cool? I thought so. Well, everybody, thanks for uh, going up on the roof with me yesterday. A couple of people asked if I would go back up and film the city at night. I think I'll do that. Uh, don't forget, I am still going to take you on a walk across the Ben Franklin Bridge as soon as the sun comes out. And I continue to thank you all, uh, old subscribers, new subscribers. Have a nice weekend. I'm Scott from the Old Curiosity Shop saying thanks for watching and so long for now.